My name's Lynn Taylor and I'm um, Education Officer for Early Learning and Childcare with Education Scotland. And um, I'm, I'm up here kind of smiling and laughing Treza, to Treza here because um, a few months back I phoned her to ask her after her fabulous inspection um, last year um, where she achieved excellence across the board. Um, and people ask, <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> A lot of people were asking me about Treza and Treza's setting um, and I thought, I wonder if there's an opportunity here actually to have Treza present at the Scottish Learning Festival. So I phoned her and said, would you mind actually just having a wee chat with a couple of people in a wee room? Um, so this is the wee chat and a couple of people in a wee room. So thank you very much, Treza. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Treza and she's going to talk about excellence and equity through highly effective use of data. And at the end of her chat, we'll have um, a chance for you to ask any questions that you may have. Can I ask you, if you want to come down, there's some seats at the front there, yeah. So can I hand over to Treza? Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Um, just a wee bit of background about myself. Um, I'm head teacher at Rickerton Early Childhood Centre, which is in Kilmarnock in East Ayrshire. Um, I've been there for quite a wee while now, and before that I was primary teacher trained. Um, and the reason I like to tell people about my background a wee bit is because, especially when we're talking about data, I'm not a mathematician. And actually I'm not really that good at maths. Obviously I needed maths to do my teaching degree, but I'm not particularly good at maths, so I'm not standing up here in any shape or form to be an expert in data. Okay? And I hope that it's great to see so many people coming along here today to hear about the use of data. I'm sure you're all very okay with the use of data, and I'm sure in your own settings you're probably using data in one way or another. But everybody will be at a different stage of their improvement journey. And I hope by the end of this uh, presentation that you go away either feeling confident to use data in your own setting, because sometimes people are a wee bit scared by the word data and what does it all mean and is it a lot of work? And hopefully you, you learn today that actually it's not. And if, if you're not using data, you start to use data and become more confident using it. And if you're already using it, hopefully you go away with the confidence and reassuring that what you're doing is the right thing. All right? So, bear with me. So, firstly, why do we use data? Well, as you all know, the National Improvement work Framework tells us that data gathered in children's progress is essential in achieving excellence and equity. So, that came out, and, and we all then knew well, this word data started to appear, and, and basically we're expected to gather data, okay? How did we become involved? Well, this is how we started. We were introduced to the improvement science methodology. Now, it was back in 2015, and I know that the Early Years Collaborative came out in about 2012, but I started hearing about it in, uh, in my council around about 2015. And people were joining work streams and they were talking about the Early Years Collaborative and coming, going to big conferences and the Improvement Science Methodology. I wasn't part of any of those work streams, um, but I was, I'm quite a nosy person, so if there's something going on in, in my own authority or another authority and so, there's change and improvement, then I want to know about it. So I started to inquire just to colleagues in my own local authority, what was it, what, was this improvement science methodology. And I started to get other colleagues to teach me uh, the PDSA model and what could we do in our own setting. Now, I was particularly interested because the PDSA model is all about change and improvement. And throughout my career, I've been very driven to improve the setting that I'm in. You know, we've got a high uh, vision that's equality, all about quality and excellence. And... It's all about making improvements, making improvements, making improvements to try and achieve that excellence uh, within the setting. So the model for improvement, just in case anybody's not aware of it, is the PDSA model, which I'm sure, sure you are quite a few with it. Um, but the model has three key questions. You have to think about what are you trying to accomplish? What change do you want to make that will result in an improvement? 
And how then can you evidence that impact of change? So where, where does it come from? Where, you know, you've got an idea in your setting, you want to, to make an improvement, but the most important part of it all is evidencing the impact that it's making for the children um, or the parents or the families or whoever. So I became really interested in this model and I started to apply it to changes that we were making within our improvement plan. In June 2018, we, were, we got a full inspection by Education Scotland um, and it, was, it was a very, ended up being a very positive inspection. Um, and one of the highlights from the inspection was our use of da data. And, and obviously that's why I'm along here speaking today. Um, so firstly, um, number one, the inspectors um, highlighted are gathering of the assessment information. So we have streamlined all our assessment processes. And I think that is important because you want your staff working on the floor with the children, building those relationships, getting to know them all, but also it's about taking those observations and driving forward that learning. And you don't need onerous amounts of paperwork. But what you do need is number two. When you collate that paperwork, when you streamline it right back, you have to ensure that everybody's got the same approach and the same understanding. So you can streamline all your paperwork, your assessment processes, but if there's not the shared understanding in your team, then it'll fall down because not everybody will have the understanding. it. So we do quite a lot of moderation exercises within the team to ensure that everybody's got that same understanding of, for instance, we, we make a skills tracker up. It looks very basic. A lot of people have asked me to borrow it. But if you just took that skills tracker away and said, oh, that's great, that's easy peasy, without knowing that the staff had the same understanding of what each skill meant, it wouldn't work. So number two was really, really important. The inspectors were able to see that, that there was that shared understanding and a consistent approach across the team. Number three was our use of the information we collate. So we streamlined the assessment processes, we gather that information, we ensure that everybody's got the same understanding. And it's, and it's through self-evaluation as well, so through myself and my senior managers, monitoring the paperwork ensures again that that consistent approach is there, but we, it's what we do with that information we get. You can't just have information and say, well, that's lovely. We can see we, Jimmy's not really developing there. We have to do something with it. So with that information, we then ensure that those children that need support or children that need challenged are given that opportunity to be supported or challenged within the centre. And we do targeted intervention groups, which are all play-based focused, um, but myself and my senior managers take those children to do targeted intervention. And finally, um, the tracking, and number four, is ensuring that no one misses out. So having those targeted group ensures that every child is making progress, whether at their own stage of development, but there's no child that's not getting the support or challenge they need, and they're being supported their own. And then we celebrate that success. So it's all about, you know, we have Star of the Week, we have a wider achievement board, we ensure that parents are on board, and it's all about celebrating that success of each child's achievement. So what data do we collect? Firstly, we collect data about children's progress over time. We collect data on literacy screening. Now, the literacy screening is in East Ayrshire Council is called ELAT. And the authority asks us to collect that every year in January. And it goes into the council. And it's all the literacy skills that children should be developing. So your sounds and words, your phonological awareness, your rhythm, your rhyme, etc. I don't know, I'm sure that there'll be other things in other councils. But the literacy screening, we have to collect that information, and I'll talk a wee bit more about that in a minute. The other areas we collect uh, data on is on the targeting intervention. So if we see children are needing support, or children need challenged as well, then we collect data on those children to ensure, make sure that we are 
what we are doing is having an impact for each child. We collect data on wider achievement, and I'll talk again about that in a wee minute, and also on parental engagement, which can often be quite a hard thing. And I, I've, I've been at Rickerton for quite a number of years now, and for a while it was just such a challenge to get parents in through the door. Some parents would be first up for everything, but it often wasn't the parents that you really needed to get in touch with. So it, I'll talk again about that in a second. So at the beginning of every year, we um, devise a driver diagram. And again, this goes back to the uh, PDSA model. And um, So every year we devise a driver diagram and we have a really ambitious stretch aim. Now last year, our aim was that 65% of our children would have achieved their developmental milestones by June. Now Rickerton is in an area of high deprivation. The majority of our children are SIM D1 and 2. So that was, was quite an ambitious straight chain. So we go on and we say what our primary drivers, our secondary drivers, and the change ideas that we're going to bring in to help support reaching this straight chain. Okay. And then at the end of the year, we gather the information on, on, the, group, on the children. Now, it doesn't just happen at the end of the year. The important part is that every term, myself and my staff members meet up, and we call them pace and challenge meetings. And we have a discussion about the children in their groups and where they are in reaching these developmental milestones. So we're not waiting to the end of the year and saying, oh, dear, that's a shame, you know, where it's weaker and maybe put in some form of intervention for each child. So we, we meet up once a term, and I think it's really important. It's brought out a lot of things, um, the pace and challenge meetings, because it's really got that consistent approach across the staff team, and it's really ensured that those wee children were not missing anyone. So as you can see, by the end of last year, this is the data we collated. So we just looked at our, our de developmental milestone trackers, and we gathered in, where are these children? So 90% had reached their health and wellbeing, 71 their literacy, and 69 their numeracy. So numeracy is still, it's, it's still more than what we thought, but it's maybe an area that, that we now need to, to focus on and develop a wee bit further. Now, the data here, this, this wouldn't be an ideal uh, form of data because it looks like a traffic light system, and I know some people might look at this and think, well, that, I'm not really so keen on that, and, Probably I'm not so keen on it either. But the reason I put it in today was just to show you, this is for the literacy screen and the authority asked us to, to hand in. Now, what we decided to do was, instead of waiting till the January time to assess the children on, this, on the literacy skills, we would look at three areas of the literacy screening earlier than um, January. So areas that the children weren't performing well in from the year before. Now, I've missed that out at the top, so I do apologise, but one was rhyme, one was rhythm, and one was sounds and words. Okay? So we look at those three areas, and now we assess the children in November, and that's where you'll see the November scores there, and then we go and revis we put in, if the children, for instance, are, are maybe at a traffic like zero, we would say, well, when we're doing their wee targets, then we'll look at that being one of their targets in their personal plans. And we put in, um, when they do small group times, we have those activities as a focus for the small group time activities. And then it's just all through play. This isn't pull you over, let's make you've got to learn your rhyme. It's all through play in the playroom. It's all through our planning. And come February, we do a reassessment again. Again through play and again in, in the playrooms. And as you'll see, some children were a fee with it already. There'll be other children you'll see there with a zero who are moving up to a one. And then there's some children who maybe move up to a two. And in May time, we'll look at it again. And the reason I put this on is not because it's a traffic light thing, because I'm not so keen on that, but it's really to show you that each child is, has made progress. Whether it be small, tiny small steps, they have made progress in one way or another. 
Now, I put this form here on to show you how simple it is to gather the data. So this form that I devised was to gather data on children's literacy skills. Okay? And what I'm looking for is what SIM D are they in? I'm, all, I'm not just looking at their literacy development, I'm also looking at their confidence. Because often what we find is that children who attend groups for support groups and that their speech is particularly poor, they're lacking a lot of confidence. And we devised a wee confidence tracker just to see how are the children performing at their group time, how are they performing within the free play time in the playroom, how are their parents finding their confidence at home. And we again, at different points, we just stick to the same. September is when we kind of identify the children. November is when we'll sort of look and see where are they at. And then February and May, we look at them again. And all we do from that information, we also, as you'll see on there, we look at their attendance, because attendance can have a big impact. So if, if they're, they're not going to make a lot of progress if they're not attending, so we can look at that. And also, parent, parental engagement is crucial, because parents have to be on board. So every parent knows that their child is getting a bit of additional support, or perhaps they're getting challenged, so we'll use a similar thing for a challenge group. And... <coughs> Parents are on board and we provide home link activities to coincide with what we're doing. And again, they're all play-based. So we have wee home link bags that will go home with the parents if we're focusing on, say, a particular sound um, or if we're focusing on concentration and listening skills. Whatever it is, the parents get a wee home link uh, to do at home. And we see how we actually track if the parents are engaging with us. So how many times they're given a wee homework thing to take away, are they bringing it back to get another one? And we're monitoring that. And we're completely open and honest with the parents. So they get to see these scores. And if they're, if they're not engaging, we're trying to help you, your child here. And we, you know, we're trying to get them involved as much as possible. Because that's how the child will develop quicker. So from that, we then plot it into a graph. Now, if you're not great with Excel, get someone else to do it for you. It is honestly simple. Get someone to set it up, and all you need to do is plot in those numbers. And when you go back in February, you plot in your new numbers. And the wee thing does it for you. It's amazing. Um, so on the, the left-hand side were all the children that we were working with. And in order you could see it a little bit better, I just blew up one of the, the graphs for you so you could see. But you'll see that the vast majority of the children are making progress. I think they're all making progress. But you'll see parental engagement's not the same for them all. You'll see attendance isn't the same for them all. And it's what we do about that. And I think by being open and honest with the parents, it highlights these things so they think, oh, you know, they're working hard to, to help my, my child. You know, I've got a part to play in this, hopefully. And, and we work together. It's about the partnership. So another area um, that we gather data on is on wider achievements. And this came about because we provide so many extracurricular activities within the centre. We go and visit the athletics arena up the road. We get the football coach in. We get a dance specialist, a music specialist, blah, blah, blah. And I'm sure you all do similar things. But we wanted to see, is this having an impact? Is this making any difference to these children? One, for their confidence, is it encouraging them to do things outside the centre? So we just very easily tracked, in term one, as part of their personal plan, there's a wee section on the personal plan, are they involved in extracurricular activities? Do they go to clubs? <coughs> I think it says clubs and things. And parents, no, no, I don't think they're keen, blah, blah, blah. Then we get specialists in, and soon the children start talking about it, and the parents, oh, they've been raving about that Dan specialist being coming in. And then we started to track, track what the, the, the children were doing. And as you can see by term three, now there were actually other boxes where there are children who don't attend things, but that top half, those children did all attend something by term three. So it is making a difference. It is having an impact on what we're doing. And parental engagement, I spoke about this at the beginning. 
And when I first um, went to Rickerton, I found it really hard to engage with some of those parents, the ones that you really want to reach out to. Um, and, and I realised the problem was how I was delivering some of the, the I was calling them workshops. So, oh, we're doing a, a maths workshop, we're doing a literacy workshop, we're doing a STEM workshop. And they're like, what? Who would like to come along? But as soon as we had our open days, our stay and play sessions, they all came. And I thought, I realised, it's my word and I'm, I'm saying this all wrong. So everything now is called stay and play. So it's stay and play with a literacy twist, stay and play with a numeracy twist, stay and play with STEM, stay and play outdoors. It's stay and play. And now the majority all come in. It's pretty amazing. Another area there, you'll see at the top, is the um, induction meeting. Again, the word's meeting. And when children used to come into the centre to begin with, I used to invite them along and say, oh, would you, I'd like you to come along to my induction meeting and hear all about the centre. And then do 40 parents and three or four would turn up and you think, what's this? You know, one tear about the centre. So now I changed it and I, one of my tests to change was in one of the, the months where the, obviously, as you know, the children come in every month after their third birthday, um, I, I said to the parents, oh, you just stay in the centre. You get tea and coffee while your child's having their hour on the first day and you stay for a tea and coffee and a wee chat with me. So now the induction meeting is a week tea and coffee and a wee chat with me and they all have to come. So, and they all come. And it's, it's informal, it was informal before, but I think by the use of the word meeting and saying, right, you know, I'm expecting you here. Oh no, I've got other commitments. Oh, I meant to arrive. But now they all stay. So I realised part of it was what, the way I was wording things. And what's happened as a result of getting those parents in on the very first induction meeting, I'm still calling it that, but first informal teen coffee session is you're building those relationships and relationships are key. So get them in the door, chat away to them, tell them all the things that they need to hear, how you really want them involved. Our fundraising uh, group has got bigger, our stay in place, sessions are more well attended, parents are coming asking my community practitioner for more information. I think it's broke down some barriers that I, I personally created. So, you know, hands up, by changing some of the wording, it has improved um, our parental engagement. And again, by just plotting that on a graph, you can see that, you know, each year it's, it has increased, it's got better. So we have to look at it every year and say, well, how, you know, how do we make Bookbug even better attended? Um, last few weeks, I he held a junior joinery session don't have that on there because it was our first year of doing it and um, it was for parents and, and children to come together and we had 75% of parents turn up. I was, I was overwhelmed. I had to end up having uh, and I got a lot of returners this year so I can tell it's about that relationship burn, building up with the parents. It's really having, having an impact. So just I'm kind of coming to the end now and I, and I threw this in because for me, it is about that continual improvement. I'm still on an improvement journey. We didn't get excellence and sit back in our laurels and think, right, that's us now, sit back. It's actually been a bit harder because you're, you're constantly thinking, whoa, people are coming to visit. People, you know, people want to hear about this. We're just an ordinary centre in Kilmarnock in East Ayrshire. We're just doing our very best, like you, everybody here in this room is doing. But I think by gathering that data to showcase the, that improvement journey that we've been on shows the impact it's having on the families. Um, so that's the reason I, that I put this in. And a rigorous self-evaluation, that constant monitoring. You, you, you just, I can't, I can't stress it enough. And it is hard work, and you're constantly saying, I need to check pace and challenge meetings, and I need to check observations, and I need to check my floor books, but it's all in a calendar, and every month there's things that, that we need to, to check and ensure that it's, it's <coughs> adhering to. And then finally, sorry it's a wee bit blurry, I stole it from Twitter, so if you're hearing I stole your, your uh, slide, I do apologise. Um, hope it's not copyright or anything. So I just put this in, because hopefully it doesn't make you think it's more on your plate. It's just, it's just building it into that, that timeline. of, And that's why I, I have three points in the year where I say, 
November, February, May, that's when I'm gathering the data in. And it's part of that annual calendar and the self-evaluation. And hopefully you go away thinking, oh, not another thing to do. And it just emphasises the good work that you already do. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Teresa. It's, you know, it's a difficult thing to articulate this because I think coldly, if you had to look at those slides, what would you think? You would see bar charts and, you know, as you were saying, the colour coding and, and you would maybe sit there and think, oh my goodness, where's the child in this? And that's why it's important to hear the story behind this because your data has to be your story. It has to, as, as Treza was saying, inform your practice and have impact. So sometimes this is why data is so difficult because it's something that you, in your setting with your staff, have to formulate for your story and your circumstance, and it has to make sense in your setting. So you're, thank you so much for coming here, Teresa, because mm -hmm. um, it's a bold thing to try to articulate that. But isn't it wonderful when it works? Mm -hmm. Because I remember actually when the data agenda came in um, to my, my setting, I was at, the, at that point working across um, early years in a, in a primary school as well. And being a wee bit horrified about this whole thing about gathering data and putting children on, plotting them on charts and, and thinking again about SIMD. And, but oh my goodness, did it open our eyes actually. Mm -hmm. We actually then, um, by gathering data and gathering, gathering the right data, we could see surprises in that data without just making assumptions about our children because I think that's something that we did in our setting. Um, we could actually see a story some children that we assumed were doing actually all right because they were maybe very confident children and we could actually see that story of hang on a wee minute in that area there's a wee dip and maybe we have to kind of find out what's going on there um, and other children actually were very surprising some children that you thought oh my goodness they are absolutely brilliant at that and we kind of missed that mm -hmm. and that's the story that that you get from data and you gather the right data and it really then informs your practice. And if you're gathering data that isn't informing your practice, as Teresa was saying, you have to have that to collaboration. Just get collaboration. Rid of it. <laughs> but it's that, why are we doing what we're doing? We have to constantly self-evaluate that. If that makes sense. Now, I'm going to open up the floor. And would anyone, has anyone got any comments, any questions? For Treza, anything you want? Go easy. Yes, two, two questions. You have to use this because we're recording. <coughs> two questions. Did your data give you the confidence in your self evaluation to match your grading and your inspection? Absolutely. Good. That's yep. And also, how do you share that data with parents? Um, I put the data, well, firstly, I've got a parent board a welcome board when you come in, and the data goes up on the parent, parent board. So what you've seen here today, parental engagement, that's all on the board. If they get the time to stop and read it. Um, but the, and for children that are getting targeted support or, or getting challenged, because we have a number of children who require challenge as well, and those children, we have that conversation with parents, and we actually show them the data. So they know. So when staff are having those meetings where we have personal plan meetings with the, with the parents, then that's discussed with the parents. So they know, just now we've just had uh, conversations about their child joining a wee focus group, a wee targeted group. Parents know that's happening. It's twice a week with myself or a senior member of staff. And they come away and as I said, it's all play focused. And, the parent know, and then we'll get back to them in November and say, here's, here's what we're finding. And Parents seem to be on board. You're, you're, you're being open and honest with them. So we're actually sharing that data along the journey. Okay. I'm actually wondering, has it helped your transitions, actually? Have you found that information in between your settings that your wee ones are going to? Um, has it actually helped that on that journey? or? don't know. I don't know. That's the honest answer. Um, we feed to about... Um, 
seven or eight different primary schools. And to be honest, that the, we'll always have conversations with the, the schools that they're going to about the children and that they have been in uh, groups and how they're doing. We don't actually share that. Maybe that's something we need to do better, is actually share that, that data. But we have the conversations, but probably do need to share it a bit better. Because we think now, again, with this agenda, that that's the kind of data now from sc the schools. It's, it's, it's almost yep. like a common, common language. Then, yes. Theme, so, yes. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions or comments? I could see you compared um, previous years in yes. the parental engagement um, data. Do you do that with all the other data that you gather? Um, yeah, we do. Obviously, we do it um, for the LAP, we do that. Um, the authority does it as well, but we, we've done it and we've looked at. Um, I'm very fortunate now because last year my senior that got appointed was an accountant. So she, she, she absolutely loves data. And um, she um, was able to take the data, just my basics. So I've only brought the basics because I didn't want to bring you the pie charts and all those things because I can hardly read them. And um, she will turn them into pie charts to tell me how the boys are faying and how the girls are faying year on year um, and things like that. So we are comparing... Um, yeah, with the, the data I put up for parental engagement, I have put it on the year, but we do look at other things like um, the wider achievement and say, you know, why is that? Is it what we're provided? Do we need to have, um, give the, the children and parents more choice in, in what we're providing? So if there's children that are not by the end of the year going to clubs and things, if there's more, then we'd look and see, well, we need to give them more choice. So things like that, yeah. So it's just back to that whole thing about the story behind the data and why you're doing it, and it's really that, that illustration of informing practice, yep. isn't it? Yep. So. Hi, Teresa. Thanks very much for that. Um, just really, what would be your advice to um, a centre just starting out in this journey? Where would they start? Yeah, well, I would say start small. Always, always start small. Um, and probably um, you'll all have a, a way of tracking children. I'm sure you all do. And if you don't, then I, I would advise you get a way of tracking children. <laughs> um, so you would do that and you would start that way and identify children that perhaps do need support in one area. Now, as I mentioned, we're doing it for concentration and listening skills. We're doing it for speech sounds. We're doing numeracy challenge groups, etc. Et but that's evolved over, over time. I would say streamline it back, get some form of assessment that's going to be not simple but easy for staff to understand and read and that consistent approach. And once you've got that, look at it in, in the first term and say, right, what is this telling me? What do the do children need? And identify those children that probably need the support. Put in an inter intervention. So you're trying that small step of change with a small group of children. Now, our groups have only got three or four children in them because it has to make a difference. And I would start with that. So one group, one focus, and see, and, and then plot it into a very simple, that, that one I showed you there, very simple, and get someone, if you're not good with Excel, to show you how to put it into a graph. And once they've set that up for you, your figures that you're putting in, the 40, 60, 60, et cetera, will come into a graph. So I would say get somebody to help you once you've identified your wee group of children and then just um, assess them. Now, our assessing of children is sim very, very simple. For instance, the concentration and listening groups, so the wee ones that come in with absolutely no concentration, can't sit in their bottoms, it's basically like a wee mini book bug session, so it's all play focused. I'll take the children, they sit on little chairs and with a wee bag, wonder what's in the bag today. Um, and another member of staff comes in for the first session and monitors how many times the child's getting up and down off their chair, moving about, not engaging, and they have many interruptions. Eight weeks later, she'll come back again and she'll say, right, let me see how your wee group's doing. And all of a sudden she's like, oh my goodness, they're sitting in their bottom, they're engaging, they're focused, they're sharing, and then she'll come back again. Now, that's, a sim that's it in its simplest form. It's not rocket science. 
It really, and I would say to start with something like that. Okay. It's actually made me think, even just um, if the Leuven scale is actually well, maybe we, starting We with. use the Leuven scale, yeah. Yes, I uh have. -huh. Um, and if you haven't seen the um, Leuven scale of involvement engagement, they're a brilliant starting point actually for um, looking at actually engagement, especially through play. Exactly. And ones are actually, yep. and it's very un unobtrusive, isn't it? You're, you're, you know, it you're actually just observing children throughout their play. Um, and making, and it really, again, it's just something that is so simple. It's a scale of five, isn't yep. it? And it really does open your eyes to um, really what's going on. And if children aren't engaged in what you have maybe, you know, are offering them, um, how you can then think about um, changing the environment or changing interactions. And um, so it's a good place to start if you're looking for somewhere to start. Um, any other questions or... One, one of the areas, just quickly, uh, that we have decided this year is a, because obviously this is continuing, we have your new set of children, but we wanted to look at the emotional well-being of children, because we had a, high, a higher number of children coming in that couldn't regulate their emotions. Mm -hmm. So we have actually, this year, as part of an improvement plan, we're looking at children's emotional well-being. And we're, <coughs> just when you're talking about the living scale there, we're using that. Um, and we found something that I'm going to say New Zealand tracker, I think, from New Zealand to use. And that's been really helpful um, to try and get these. We've created a, a kind of wee nurture area that children can go and sort of regulate their emotions. Um, and we're using that and we're sort of tracking the emotional well-being because we, we felt we didn't have anything on that. And I, just in case that's something that other people are finding as well, um, we've found that quite helpful this year. That's great. I've been passed a wee note as well just to say that. Thanks, Janet. <laughs> um, you're right that PowerPoint and Excel, they actually have got a wee how-to um, at the start of the um, how to use this and it's really quite simple to kind of follow and we did that as well to kind of get our, our wee chart started but, um, and it's, it's not too bad, it's actually Excel I think, especially if you're from an education background you can kind of think, oh my goodness, but then you actually get quite into it I have to say <laughs> once you start. Um, any other comments or questions? Um, Teresa, I, I think it's been really interesting today because we know that settings right across Scotland, not only in early learning and childcare, but in other sectors, school sectors as well, really do struggle with tracking and monitoring of children's progress. Um, and I really liked your idea about um, what you call your pace and challenge meetings and that idea of just sitting down on a regular basis and having a discussion that includes every single individual child and no child being missed in that because I think we can all think of the children who are, you know, skirting along, doing fine, but actually we don't ever sit down yeah. and have a good conversation about their pr progress. Um, but my question actually was related to this slide here um, and, and thinking about that fact that people are really keen to, to think more about their monitoring and tracking processes. And I see that you have got a series of numbers here. And I wondered if you could tell us a wee bit more about where these numbers come from. Yep. So the, the confidence one is a confidence tracker that we, we devised. Um, and that's looking at the children's, just a scoring, like the Leuven scale, very like that. So we've devised our own <laughs> scoring system uh, for children um, who are highly confident, because some of them are, children who, so one to five of, of their confidence. And we, we score them within the free play environment, so talking to the key worker. Um, we score them within the little group setting when they come in, and they're also scored um, from what the parents are telling us as well, and that's all added <coughs> together. So that's their score. So you'll see some are 14, some are 60. And then if we go on to the next one, you'll see how some then go up. I'm trying to find. Uh, confidence went from 50 up to 75, and then 85 and then 95 for a child in the first column. So you can see how confidence is a really big influence. Uh, for literacy, we worked alongside the speech and language therapist to devise a, a, a tracker, if you like, on speech sounds. And it assisted the communication champion in um, seeing what children needed support. So it's a quick sort of assessment. And again, through fun games, rhymes, songs, books, um, we assess the children, so that's the scoring for that. Um, take me back. 
Um, attendance was just a percentage from our Siemens records. So that's quite simple to get through that period of time. What was our attendance like from this date to this date? And parental engagement, we just gathered from how many times. So they were to bring the, the, book, the bag back, the re bag back every week. How many times did they bring it back kind of thing? Was there a hundred, did they do it every week or did they not bring it back very often? And we just collated that into percentage. So it was very simple. Can I say a huge thank you to Teresa um, for coming and talking to us this afternoon.